Okay, so welcome to a very challenging study. Um, obviously, you came out tonight because you heard we were going to do Revelation. Uh, how many of you have actually gone through a study of Revelation uh, in this church? Anybody? A couple of you, because it's been, I think, 2007 was the last time that we did it. Uh, as I've shared with you before, it took us a year to go through Daniel and the Revelation because we don't get in a hurry. There's so many things. Uh, in this book, and there's so much figurative language, and there's so many descriptions that uh, I, I think if you, those of you who went through it before, you can start to see or have some idea of what John actually saw. Uh, so we will, we will definitely take our time and enjoy this. Um, where, where we are, okay, we, some of you went through Daniel with me, so let me just quickly remind you, the second half of Daniel really was critical because it taught us the beginning of prophecy. Daniel was given visions and things that he was allowed to see. Remember, he saw the four kingdoms of men. And he got progressive uh, prophecy as God revealed to him each of those kingdoms. The first one was what? Does anybody remember? It was the first kingdom of men. Babylon. Thank you. Babylon was the first kingdom of men. And that's the kingdom that Daniel was alive during that time. What was the second kingdom? Medo-Persian. The Medes and the Persians came in and took over after Babylon. And, and Daniel got to see the beginning of that. He was alive when that transition took place. And then who was the third kingdom? The Greek Empire. Thank you, Alexander the Great. And he did not live long enough to see that kingdom. And yet God made it very clear through prophetic vision. He identified them. And so Daniel knew hundreds of years before he even... He even died, after, after he died, it was hundreds of years before that kingdom even came. And so the third kingdom was the Greek kingdom. The fourth kingdom would be the one yet in the future. To be the one still to come. The one of the Antichrist. And so that's where we really pick up in this study. You see, when, when uh, we had those 69 weeks of Daniel, and there were 69 periods of seven years we discussed. And you could literally go back to the time that the Babylonians sent the, Jew, the Israelites back to Jerusalem and they started worshiping again. Remember, they started worshiping in the temple and that's when the clock started. And the clock continued all the way up until the temple was no more. And that was after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And so the first 69 weeks were a period of time that affected the Jews. It was prophecy for the Jewish people. Well, it all stopped with the temple. And so we're in a period of time now, it's an unknown period of time, between the 69th week of Daniel and the 70th week of Daniel, which we have identified as the tribulation period. And we're in that period of time, we don't know how long it is, because it's not given in the scriptures how long it will be. As Jesus said, what? No man knows the hour or the day when he's going to return. He didn't even know himself. And so he said, don't ask me the question, because I can't tell you when I'm coming back. So we don't know when Jesus is returning. But we do know, as we're going to see tonight, that it will be soon. Definitely sooner than the days that this was written in. Okay? So, that's where we are. We're in that 69th to 70th week of Daniel, according to prophetic history. And we're going to start there. Now, I want to run by you the three reasons for studying prophecy. And, and I do this, and some of you have heard me say it over and over again. I saw prophecy abused when I was a child. I saw it abused when I was growing up in church. Because they use prophecy to scare people. They use prophecy to try to get people to run down to an altar because they thought hellfire and damnation was coming tomorrow and you needed to come and, and ask Jesus to come into your life so you could avoid the end times. Okay, that's abusing prophecy. That, that's not what it was intended for. Are there those that get saved if, because they hear of it? Yes, remember? I read Gene Getz's, um, his testimony of his salvation. So yes, as a young man, he read the books about end times. And he did realize it was true. And eventually he did kneel and pray in his bed next to one of his parents uh, from that truth. So it does happen that people will sometimes get saved because of the teaching of prophecy. But really, what's the teaching of prophecy for? It's for us. Daniel was seen, shown prophecy for the Jewish people. That's who it was for. John was shown prophecy, as you're going to hear tonight, for the church. It wasn't written to unsaved people. It was written to us. And there's three big reasons why. The first one is purity of life. All right? Prophecy is written and recorded and preserved for us, believers, to help us live pure lives. 
The return of Jesus Christ should not scare a true follower of Christ, should it? No, not for ourselves. We should actually somewhat look forward to it. It's something that should excite us. when he come, Lord, come quickly is scriptural. We should be that way. But it shouldn't scare us. Instead, it should motivate us. It should motivate us to live such godly lives that we are found in a way that would be honorable, right? Because if we truly believe He's coming soon, and if we believe He could come at any given time, how do we want to be found? I love to share that question. Where and how do you want Jesus to find you when He returns? Because He can return at any day. So what do you want Him finding you do? I've always said I want Him to find me in the pulpit. When He returns, this is where I want to be. Now if that's together, that's okay, because that won't traumatize you. But if it's just for me individually, He might want to do something different. Because I can't imagine you sitting there when he does that to me. Alright, so that would be maybe bad. But when it comes for his church, I'd love to be found at church. Wouldn't you? I mean, honestly, wouldn't you want to be found worshiping, singing hymns? That would be that awesome next step in. But that's a very small portion of our lives. What does the rest of our life look like? Well, we should live it in light of the fact he can come at any given point. And it should motivate us to live pure lives. The second thing, it provides hope in an evil world. It provides hope in an evil world. We hear so much about evil. Uh, we heard about the, uh, the rental van up in Toronto, wasn't it, this week? Took, what, 10 innocent lives? Uh, we, we read about, again, school shootings have become so common. We read about acts of terrorism. We read about so much evil in our world today, and it's accelerating, is it not? Yes, the ability to, to report has gotten bigger, their technologies allowed us to see things all over the planet, but there is no question that the evil is growing in the world, that evil acts of evil men are taking more and more lives, causing more and more devastation, um, but you know what, we, we understand where it's going. We know what the scriptures say about the end times, about how people will be, and we can look forward and say, okay, yes, it's bad and getting worse, but there is an end in sight. There is an end in sight. And so it should give us hope that this does not continue forever. Finally, it gives us encouragement in times of sorrow. Um, and this is a big one. Encouragement in times of sorrow. As, as somebody who, who, who preaches a lot of funerals, uh, this is huge. Is how does someone get through the passing of a loved one without this truth? Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16-18, for the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died will raise from their graves. Then, together with them, we, Paul believed this would happen in his life, who are still alive and remain on earth, will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. And his final words were so encouraged each other with these words. So the teaching of the end times should be encouraging. Because guess what? If you and I are alive, when the end times begin, we're going to be reunited with those who've gone on before us, right? Grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, uh, siblings, however. Uh, whatever loved one has passed away, spouses, uh, if they passed away in the Lord, if Jesus comes today, it's your reunion. Right? It's your time together for how long? Forever. You've been separated long enough. When He returns, you will be given back your loved ones that went on before you in the Lord forever. Is that not encouraging? That's why Paul said at the end of that passage, encourage each other with these words. So we should not be scared by end times prophecy. We should be driven to live pure lives. Uh, we should realize there is hope in this world. And we should understand that this should be encouraging for us because there's a great reunion coming. That's why we teach it. It's why I teach it. And that's what I'll focus on while I teach it. So armed with that and the understanding of that, let's go to Revelation chapter 1 for the introductory study tonight. Not as long as they'll typically be. Uh, so again, you'd be grateful for that. But we will definitely get into some deep stuff even in this first study. Revelation chapter 1, I will read the entire chapter and then we will get the introductory material. Pay close attention to the words of John and see what you can pick out that's important for the context. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him 
or gave him to show the servants the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is the report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. This letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come. From the sevenfold spirit before, the thro before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. He is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead, and the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven, and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, who is still to come, the Almighty One. I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering in God's kingdom and in the patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. It was the Lord's day, and I was worshiping in the Spirit. Suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. It said, Write in a book everything you see, and send it to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands, and standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white with wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth. And his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. When I saw him... I fell at his feet as if I were dead, but he laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and the grave. Write down what you have seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen. This is the meaning of the mystery of the seven stars you saw on my right hand and the seven lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. We'll stop right there. Let's ask the Lord to bless His Word. Father, thank You for preserving Your Word for this day. It has a special purpose for us. It, it, it's here to encourage us. It's here to give us hope in this, this dying world. And Father, it's here to drive us to live lives that are pure. So thank You for that. Thank You for the motivation. Thank You for the preservation. And now help us to understand what we've heard and apply it to our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you catch anything out of the reading that just struck you initially that maybe you hadn't heard before or that encourages you? Future history is fascinating, isn't it? It is. The future, I like that. Future history. Very good. Because it is God's history, even though it's our future. Anything else? Okay, then let's just ask. Who was the author? Oh, Eddie, go ahead, Eddie. What did he mean when he said, looks like? Looks like. He said, it looks like son of, son of man. That's what it was. Okay. Um, how, would he, how would he know who it looked like? Who was Jesus' best friend? John. John. That's why he says it looks like the son of man. Because if you read the rest of the description, he's got a tongue that's got blades, he's got fire, he's got, he's got different figurative language and yet he still recognizes him as our Savior. So that's why he says it that way. Because he does give a lot of these needs. And, and remember, that language matches what we heard in Daniel. 
That language, we, I brought you over here when we were back in Daniel to say, okay, this was written in 500 B.C., that's written in 100 A.D. So 600 years difference and the description is the same. So he is using the language from Daniel, uh, clearly that he would have known, in identifying Jesus, but he's saying he looks like the Son of Man, the guy that I know. Okay? Alright? So that's why he would say that, Eddie. Okay, now the author is the Apostle John. And he names himself, by the way. And John was really the only one to live a full life. The rest of the apostles died brutally. You know, Peter, we believe, uh, history tells us, was crucified upside down because he said he wasn't worthy to be crucified right side up. Uh, several of them were stoned, some were beheaded. Uh, they just died horrible, horrible lives. But John, and if you go all the way back to say, hey, somebody, Jesus mentioned that somebody's going to live long enough to get this. If you go back in one of the Gospels, He's talking about John. John was given this privilege of living this long so that he could have uh, this prophecy. Now John, he left Jerusalem about 65 AD, history tells us. Uh, so he left Jerusalem about 30 years after Jesus was dead, buried, and resurrected. Uh, so he left there and he goes to Ephesus and he ministers there for several years. Uh, we know from Eusebius, an early church historian, that John was exiled to Patmos in the 15th year of Domitian. Domitian came after the guy who destroyed the city. You remember the guy who destroyed the city? Who destroyed the city in 70 AD? Titus, thank you. Uh, the Roman Titus destroyed the city in 70 AD, and that would fulfill the prophecy that Jesus said there's not going to be one stone left on top of the other. So that was fulfilled, and that was the end of the temple phase. It was in 70 AD. That was the end of those 69 weeks of Daniel. Now we're in this other period. Well, Domitian came next. Domitian was the next ruler, and he was the one who exiled um, John to Patmos. Domitian died, and after Domitian died, John was released, and that was 96 AD. So since we know this was written during his exile, probably written in the early 90s AD. That's when this was written by John. And John tells us in verse 9 and 10 that he revealed, or he got this revelation while in exile. On what day? Did you catch it? The Lord's Day, Sunday. Alright, we talk about the Sabbath was Friday night from 6 o'clock till Saturday night at 6 o'clock. Now we see in the New Testament they have began worshiping on the Lord's Day, which was the first day of the week, the day of resurrection. That was the shift, okay, in the worship. And so he is worshiping, this is his Sunday worship, and during his Sunday worship he gets the revelation. So that's John, that's when he got it, as we hear in verse 9 again, while he's in exile. So the next question is, who is he writing to? Did you pick that up? Who is he writing to? The churches of Asia, alright? Now before I explain those, and that's the interesting part that I'll talk about tonight, um, who was the originator? Okay, Jesus was the originator of this word. Right, Jesus was the original. John was the individual who put pen to paper, but he gives credit to Jesus Christ for the revelation. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, all right, as given through John. Our resurrected Savior literally gives these words to John, the revelator. When you think about it, it makes sense. As I mentioned already, who was Jesus' best friend on earth? It was John. All right, John was the one who laid on his breast. John was the one who was closest. It was the disciple whom Jesus loved was John. And so John definitely knew who Jesus was, would, would have recognized him there in that picture. Uh, and so John was the one who was given this from Jesus Christ. Uh, John was punished many times, but he was allowed to live a long life so that he could be the one to give this revelation. Now, it's, it's obviously later in his life when Jesus appears to him personally. Uh, even though the book of the Bible is difficult to read and understand, we have to accept that these are the words of Christ. So many people, and even the early church fathers, did not want to include this book in the Bible. This and the book of Hebrews. There were two books that really they didn't want, they fought till the end, not to add to the full canon. The canon would be the 27 books of the New Testament. Uh, just canonized. They all made sure that they're there. These were some of the last ones to get in. Hebrews was one of the last to get in because it doesn't have an author. They don't really know who wrote it, and so they wrestle around. And its, it's Greek was completely different from the rest of the New Testament. And so they really struggled, but the message was clear, and it was obvious who it was written to, so they did eventually include it. Revelation was the one that nobody wanted to touch. Right? It just had some crazy, crazy language in it. Like, what in the world? Again, you're talking 4th um, century when the church fathers are putting the Bible together. 
So even in the fourth century, did they know what a bomb would have looked off, like going off? Would they know what a fighter jet would have looked like? Would they know what a chemical weapon would have looked like? They would not have known any of those things in the fourth century any more than John would have known them in the first century. So it all sounds a little crazy. Huge locust? What's that? Could that be a helicopter? Huh. Right? The things that John saw were still not seen in the fourth century. So they struggled to include this. But we have to remember and understand this is the word of Jesus Christ. It's a testimony of Jesus now given through the eyes and pen of John. So John is trying to write things that if Jesus came today, right, in the 21st century, how would John be able to describe some things that we have? How would he describe a car going down the road? How would he describe a road, right? How would he describe a skyscraper, a building? How would he describe a lot of things? There were so many things that did not exist 2,000 years ago that John saw and was told, write these things down. So he did the best he could to write these things as descriptively as he could. And that's why it sounds sometimes crazy. They think John was going nuts while he was exiled. No, he wasn't. He was actually trying to describe the things he saw from the future. That makes sense to me. I hope it does to you. Okay? Now, you've got the audience. The audience is the church. I alluded to this in the introduction. The audience of Daniel was the Jewish people. The Jewish people who would return from exile and go back to Jerusalem. That's the audience of the book of Daniel. So the audience of that first revelation or, or the main revelation of the Old Testament was given to the Jews. This is given to who? Us. This is given to the church. Okay? This is given to the church. Now, he mentions the seven churches of Asia. And there are several theories about this. The first theory is that they are literal churches. The seven churches of Asia are literal churches. And this theory can't be denied. Because if you place these churches on a map today, all the churches that he just listed, it would be like a, a mail route. When the way he talks about them, they would literally be on a route that if you were traveling from one to the next, you would follow a route to get to them, which that would have happened in the first century. So when they were delivering it, there were these churches that existed in that day in those literal places. So there's no question that John was given this text or this, this command to write this letter to pass it on to the churches of his day. Had to give him some hope of getting off this island, right? I mean, when you stop and think about it, he is exiled to Patmos. Why does he think he's going to get off? Jesus just gave him a message to take to the rest of the churches. Thank you. I appreciate that. You just gave me my letter off the island. But literally, these were churches. And remember, I told you, that's how the Bible was built. The Bible was built because Paul wrote his letter to Ephesus. Church at Ephesus read it, copied it, and sent it on out. He wrote his letters to Corinth. Corinth read it. Read it to the congregation, copied it, sent it on out. And so they would send out their letters. Well, that's the same thing that happened to the book of Revelation. Started off with the first church, went to the next church, traveled around. So we have no doubt that these were, these were literal churches. Okay? Literal churches. But they also had to be figurative churches. Why else would it have been preserved? There are no churches in some of these locations today. You've seen, um, you've seen some of the pictures that I show in Ray Vanderlaan. Most of these places are in ruins and weren't even found until the 19th century. Weren't even uncovered until almost our lifetime. And so if it was only to those churches, then this letter died. Then this letter shouldn't exist today. So obviously there's a figurative side to these churches. Okay? It has to be because it's preserved for us and saved for us. Now, even under this part, there are two theories. One is that there are seven eras of church. E-R-A-S. Eras of churches. Okay, and, and some scholars believe that this is true. That as you walk through these churches, it's a, it's a layout of the historical Christian church in the world. When you walk through them, you see that, okay, the first church they come to was that first church. And then the next era would be the next church and the next church. And the, there are some arguments that support this. There's no question. When you look at the way historical church play, but there's a lot of gaps in this theory. And there's a lot of things that, that don't line up. But some scholars do believe that figuratively, this is the eras of the church that have existed since Jesus left. Okay? So they think it's in series, one after the other. 
Now, there are others, and this is the camp in which I will teach and I believe, that there are seven kinds of churches, not seven eras. Could fit the eras, but there's no doubt. When we study each of these churches, in the next few weeks, we're going to cover a couple churches at a time. And because we can't cover them all at once, so we won't do them justice. So it will take us a while to get through these churches. We've got to cover them all uh, because he says so much about them. But it is very clear, and most of the scholars, at least the ones that I read, believe that all seven kinds of churches have existed all the time since the church started. And you're going to see that. When we start teaching that, uh, with each church, I'm going to challenge you to think of examples. You know, examples, and you'll find it's really easy to see an example of each church today. There's no doubt you'll find an Ephesus church today. You'll find a Laodicean church today. No question that you'll see those evidences. Okay? And, and, and we have to teach it that way because he gives corrective measure for each church. He says, if you find yourself as this church, this is what you need to do. And that's in his grace. So whatever church we find ourselves in, when we study these churches, we know how to respond. So it just makes more sense that there are kinds of churches that exist all the time throughout the history of the church. Again, I think you'll agree with that as we go. Okay, kind of a summary of the introduction. Uh, we studied the book of Daniel, so verse 7 shouldn't surprise us. If you look back at verse 7, you will find uh, that Jesus is going to what? He's going to break the sky. And who's going to see him? Everybody. Everybody on the planet. So this is a... You got to picture this. You know the planet ro rotates, right? So he's going to break the sky. This is at least going to be long enough that everybody on the planet will be able to see him come. Isn't that something? I mean, you kind of picture the sky roll back, as it says when the song says it kind of rolls back the sky, and, and you can see Jesus coming. And what an impressive sight that will be! Who will be with him? Say loud. We will, right? The church will be with him. He will bring back his, his soldiers with him, which is the church. Because the church, as we'll discuss, is taken uh, before this all begins. And so he comes back with his army. And so the world sees Jesus returning with this army. What's the world do in response? Does it fall on its feet, on its face, and, and repent? Nope. It regroups. The world actually regroups and sets up to defend itself against him. Even... The last sighting of Jesus Christ. The unsaved world won't repent. They'll stand to fight against him. And we know he wins. We already know he wins. Okay, so that summary was given in Daniel. And it's given again in Revelation. That's why I teach them together. Because they're both consistent. Alright, so let me talk about a couple of purposes here. For what we've learned today. These are the purposes John would have written. The first purpose was to encourage the believer, believers of John's day. Courage of believers of John's day. If this was written, which we firmly believe would have been the early 90s, something had happened. When the church first came into existence, it was known. Did anybody remember what the church was known as first? Say that. I thought I heard it. The Way. Okay? It was known as the Way. And it didn't scare the Romans at first. Right? Because they thought it was. Just Judaism. They thought it was another branch because there were several branches to Judaism. And so they just assumed since Paul went to the synagogue, since the other guys went to the synagogue and taught the Jewish synagogue, they just assumed that this was another form of Judaism. That it was another branch, the way. Okay? But that changed. As the Jews, we talked about Sunday night, remember? How did the Jews feel in Thessalonica when Paul went to the synagogue and started reaching out to the God-fearing Gentiles? How did, the, what, how did the Jews respond? They didn't like it. They got jealous, was the word said in Acts chapter 17. The Jews got jealous. They went to the Romans. They told the Romans, these guys are not with us. They're stirring the people up. And so as that happened more and more, the Romans started to say, wait a minute. We haven't approved of their religion. We haven't approved of these guys. And so eventually the Romans began to turn against the way or against Christianity. And so by the early 90s, Christianity had been outlawed in most places. And definitely shortly after, when this letter would travel through the known world of the day, through modern day Turkey, 
when it would travel through the churches of the Gentiles, Christianity would be under persecution. And we know that these, these leaders were horrible. Some of you got to, go to, got to go to Rome. Dana and Mike got to go to Rome and experience the catacombs where the church had to go underground. And they had to literally go underneath the city because they were going to be killed and brutalized. How were they killed? Um, history tells us that Christians during these days were put on stakes and dipped in wax and lit alive before the Roman dinner parties. <coughs> right. That's, that's a, a historical fact. They were also sewn up into animal skins and taken into the Colosseum in Rome or in the other colonies and they would turn loose the wild animals that they haven't fed for days. And they would eat the Christians who were sewn up in the skins of animals while people watched and cheered. This is what that first century and second century church was experiencing. And so John was moved to write these words to say, just as I said earlier, there's hope, guys. As bad as this is, there is hope. There, the justice will happen. Okay? It will come to this earth. And the righteous will rise and the unrighteous will fail. And so it was written for encouragement to the believers of John's day who were suffering horribly. Are people suffering like that today, Christians? Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Speak it up. Because Christians are being drowned. They're being burnt alive in cages and they're being beheaded. Okay? And they're being crucified. If you've not paid attention uh, throughout the Muslim world, there are a lot of crucifixions of Christians. And we just don't see a lot of it. it it's not newsworthy for some reason. But it is really, really happening today. The same persecution. And so the teaching of Christ's soon return is to encourage those who have lost loved ones in persecution like that or face it themselves. It's to say, keep fighting. It gets better. That's a promise. Okay? It's also written to complete the prophetic truths of the Old and New Testament. It's the end of the Bible. Remember, it gets to the end and says, don't add anything to this. Don't take anything away from it. And what he said at the beginning? He blesses the one who teaches it and blesses the one who obeys it. So it's very clear. This is to complete the prophetic truths. Because if you go back... And you study some of the minor prophets, which I know Andrew's had a chance to do. Maybe some of you got to go through that. There's a lot of future prophecy written in a lot of the minor prophets. And what you find, and I'll try to filter them in when I, when I come to them. I'll try to wrap them in. But you find that there's a lot of prophecy in the Old Testament that Revelation brings together. And it actually puts it together like a puzzle. And so this book was given to complete the prophecies of the Old and New Testament. And then finally, the most important reason is to reveal Jesus Christ. That's, that's why it was written. That's what it originally says here, is to reveal Jesus Christ. He will come in His power, and we know that is true. Last thing on your handout, the time is what? Near. The time is near. As I, as I brought out and emphasized in that Thessalonians passage, Paul said, and we who remain. He believed in the 60s A.D., that Jesus was going to come before He died. We should all live that way, right? The time is near. And if Paul believed it was near in the 60s AD, how much nearer should it be in 20,018? <laughs> right? A lot nearer. At least a whole bunch of years do the math. Nearer than it would be. The time is definitely near. And I'll echo what he said. For our final words, Revelation 1-3, God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, and He blesses all who listen, okay, not just listen, listen to the message and obey what it says, for the time is near. So this, it is good that we're studying. If you look around, talked about it before, uh, one of the major prophetic things was Israel coming back together. That started in the 1940s. It's happened in some of your lifetime. Yeah, 1948 it started. Have they started worshiping yet? No. But they are ready to worship on a given notice. If they can get the green light to push the Dome of the Rock off of Mount Moriah, they'll set up the altar just like the group did, Zerubbabel did when he returned. They didn't build the temple first. They built the altar first. And they started worshiping day one. And so the day that they pushed the Dome of the Rock off, they set up the temple they were worship day one. What's that the beginning of? The end. That could happen any given day. So it is near. 
And we need to be living like we truly believe. Alright, Jim, what's our song? 100. Page 100. Would you stand with us, please? <laughs> 